Hello, and welcome to the fourth in this series of lectures on the electrical and electrochemical characterization by scanning probe microscopy. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the lateral transport measurements by the force base SPM. So this includes the topics such as the Kelvin probe force microscopy of the laterally biased devices, its extension to the time-resolved KPFM, and the KPFM analogs that operate in the frequency rather than time domain, such as scanning impedance microscopy and uh, beyond. Let's start with a very quick recap of how the KPFM works, or KPFM is also known as scanning surface potential microscopy. So here, we scan the surface using the AFM tip and the tapping or contact mode. Then we lift the tip and retrace the surface potential, maintaining the constant separation. During this interleave line, we apply the periodic bias, having the DC component and the AC component to the tip. This bias results in the capacitive force. We use the lock-in amplifier in order to select the first harmonic of this force. And we use the feedback loop to nullify this uh, signal. And it turns out that this nulling condition corresponds to the case when the DC potential on the tip, which we control, is equal to the surface potential that we want to measure. And it turns out that if we map the nulling potential, then we get a map of the surface potential. And for ideal feedback, the signal is independent on our response, so this technique is quantitative. In the previous lectures, we discussed uh, the mechanisms of how the lock-in detection works and uh, the ways to extend KPFM using the band excitation or G-mode uh, detection. And we discussed a little bit the possible artifacts in the KPFM. So in this lecture, we are going to focus only on the applications of the KPFM and related techniques to study the active devices, meaning the devices which are laterally biased. So this is what I mean. So if we have a semiconductor or any other system, if the surface is grounded, we can measure the surface potential features associated with the grain boundary, defects, any kind of uh, charge redistribution due to the defects or injected charges. And uh, as illustrated, when we do these measurements, we need to be very sensitive to the phenomena such as surface screening, which tends to even inverse the sign of the potential features. But for another way to use the KPFM is to study the active devices when we apply the lateral bias across the device. And then we start to explore how the surface potentials evolve in response to the applied lateral bias. So in this case, these measurements are equivalent to the four probe resistance measurements, except that instead of the two fixed voltage electrode, like a normal four probe resistance measurements, we use the AFM tip as the mobile voltage electrode. Now, one very important thing is that I assume that we already discussed the screening phenomena and the fact that there are always surface charges. So from time to time, I'm going to make an explicit reference to this screening phenomena and uh, uh, how they are likely to affect this lateral transport measurements. But I assume that you already seen the presentation on the grain boundaries and the uh, ferroelectrics where the screening charges basically control what we measure. So how do we do the lateral transport measurements by the KPFM? And a good way to start is basically do it yourself, just procure a device. So it turns out that going to the radio shack and buying a LED or a Schottky diode or something like this is a great way to start. The second thing that we need to do is to always start with measuring the macroscopic properties, either IV curve or the capacitance voltage curve or sort of whatever macroscopic characteristic you're interested in. And the reason for doing it is that during, first of all, we need to know this macroscopic characteristics for the interpretation of the KPFM and more complex data. And secondly, because these properties can change during the 
device preparation. So if we have a package Schottky diode or LED and we have a Polish Schottky diode or LED, the properties can change as a result of the preparation procedure and we need to make sure that it actually does. Now, the Kelvin probe and all other SPMs are actually surface sensitive, so we cannot magically look inside the package device. We actually need to cross-section it. So we can polish it off and then we need to check that the transport properties did not change or didn't change much. The next step is to put this device under the microscope so we can scan the area of interest. Uh, and this is the example. So this is a cross-section Schottky diode. This is the silicon. This is the uh, current collector. This is the uh, soldering material that used to solder the chunk of silicon to the electrode. And this is my AFM tip that I used to scan across this region. Now, one important thing, and uh, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this step, is that your device needs to be connected in series with the current limiting resistors. These resistors can be pretty small, so practically anywhere from hundreds of ohms to mega ohms is something that you can use. And I will show you the examples of the effect of the current limiting resistor. But the important thing is that always do it this way. And the reason for that is that, first of all, if you connect your device directly to the current source, you can have the large uh, currents flowing from the device into the tip. The tip burns. In my experience and experience of many of my colleagues, if that happens, uh, you just lose the tip. It works as the uh, fuse. But you, you at least need to change the tip after that. Second reason is that uh, when you analyze the result of the lateral measurement by KPFM or related techniques, you need to reconstruct the equivalent circuit of the system. And unfortunately, uh, the equivalent circuit needs to include the resistive elements. And if you don't put the current limiting resistors, this would be the output impedance of your power source, which you don't know and which for many power sources tends to be dependent on the current load. So for example, your power source can switch from uh, 50 to 100 ohm output impedance and this can be misinterpreted as some kind of physical mechanism. So the idea is that always connect your uh, system with the current limiting resistors that allow you to avoid the tip burn down, so typically a kilo ohm for that would be enough. And it also makes your system well defined from the physical viewpoint. And uh, then you have all this assembly in the AFM so that the tip is over your region of interest. And for the short kit diode, this is what you get. So this is the example of the potential profiles across the interface between the uh, silicon and the metal. So you don't see it, but it's here. Uh, across this interface. So for the positive bias, your potential distribution is uniform. There is no potential drop at the interface. There are only waves due to the surface topography, crosstalk, and things like this, and they're independent on bias. Once you start to decrease the bias, so you decrease your bias, so you go from uh, 3 volts to 2 volts to 1 volt and so on, Notice that the absolute value of potential in this case is about half of uh, applied bias because I have a low resistant termination. So I have a current termination resistor on the left and on the right. So the potential in the middle is exactly half of it. So if I apply 5 volt, I measure 2.5 volt. Then at about zero voltage, uh, the resistor, the diode is switched from the forward to the reverse bias regime and I start to see the potential drop on the interface. So for negative biases, now the potential drop happens at the interface. And what's interesting is that uh, on my negatively biased end, the potential is almost exactly the negative bias, so close to minus 5 volts. And uh, on the positive end, it's grounded, so it's close to 0 volt. And now you can start to see some very interesting things which basically tell you quite a lot, both about how the KPFM works and about what happens inside the device. So first of all, notice this waves in this image. 
So they have perfectly reproducible for different biases they just ship down. So this is the result of the topographic crosstalk in this particular case. Secondly, if you look at the shape of this interface, you can see that there is a very sharp drop across the interface. And then there are tails going to the right and to the left. And the width of this tail is about uh, 15 microns. So it turns out that this tail is exactly the effect of the finite size of the cantilever. So this is a long range interaction between the whole of the cantilever and the surface. The 90% of the signal comes from the highly localized tip surface interaction. But the remaining 10% of the signal comes from the cantilever. And this is something that we can easily quantify. Notice that for a good tip, this potential drop would be dominant. For a bad tip with a damage coating or whatever, the fraction of the information within this tail would be much higher. So this is something that tells you about the both local and non-local component in the KPFM. So this is the example of the potential profile for the high resistance termination. So in this case, rather than having, say, kilo ohm resistor, I will put a 100 kilo ohm resistor. And lo and behold, interesting things start to happen. So for uh, positive biases, when the diode is forward biased, I have the same picture as for the lower R termination. So my potential doesn't drop at the interface, and the value of the potential is about the half of the voltage that I applied. But in this case, when my, uh, I apply zero voltage and lower, I still see no potential drop on the interface. And you can see that it develops much slower. So I start to see appreciable potential drops only for much uh, uh, more negative potential values. So what goes on? Okay, let's do it a little bit more systematic fashion. Let's characterize what is the dependence of the potential drop across the interface as the function of the applied lateral potential. So this is the surface topography of my region. So this is silicon. You can see that it's rather rough and kind of hand polished. This is our connector material. And the metal and semiconductor interface is roughly here. Now imagine that I apply the potential across the device that goes as a triangular wave from minus 10 volts to plus 10 volts to minus 10 volts and so on. And I do it very slowly. So the period of this wave is uh, about 1000 seconds, so it's one millihertz. And uh, while I'm scanning across the surface, each line is acquired in about one second. So if I compare the surface potential image to this applied bias, I can see that when I'm forward biasing the system, I don't see any potential drop. And when I negative bias, I start to see the potential drop at the metal semiconductor interface. So basically, I, I observe the diode operation in the real space and notice that in this case, I don't need any special modification to my microscope. I just need a function generator that can give me the millihertz wave. So what I can do is I can analyze these potential profiles and I can plot the potential drop across the interface. So this is something that I measure locally using KPFM as the function of the lateral bias I apply across the device. Notice that uh, in the microscopic measurement, I can measure the whole IV characteristic of the device, but I don't know where the potential drops exactly are. In the Kelvin probe force microscopy experiment, I measure exactly how much potential is drops across the specific region of interest. Of course, correcting for the cantilever shape and so on and so forth. So once I do that, I start to get the curves as shown on this graph. So you can see that for a small current terminating resistance, 10 kilo ohms, the potential, there is no potential drop for forward bias. And then there is a linear potential drop for negative bias. But when I increase the current limiting resistor from 10 kilo ohm to 47 to 100, all the way to one mega ohm, you can see that this onset of this curve shifts to negative biases and the slope of these curves becomes smaller. So what's, go what's going on? Well, let's look at the classical equation that describes the IV characteristic of the diode. 
So in this case, my current flowing through the diode is the I node, this saturation current, times this exponential function, which is determined by the height of the potential barrier, uh, plus second term, which is the leakage resistance. So in the forward bias regime, when I am in the for the positive voltages, my potential drop across the interface is actually very small. It is determined by the Kt over Q, so this is just 27 uh, milli electron volts, and logarithm of V divided by 2R I0. So this is really a small number, especially for uh, especially for uh, small Zar. But in the reverse bias region, my uh, potential drop across the diode is determined basically by the uh, this leakage resistance of the interface, which is in parallel to the diode behavior. So what I can do is I can take these formulas and essentially determine the slopes and this uh, crossover point, and I can reconstruct the saturation current and the leakage resistance of the device for different values of the resistor. And you can see that the values that I get are pretty, pretty reasonable. So I get something like from 5 to 8 and 5 microamps. In comparison, the macroscopic IV measurements give me about 8 microamps. And my leakage resistance is also roughly the same. So it is somewhere between 700 or, and 900 kilo ohms. So basically what happens in this case is that once we start to add more and more uh, large circuit limiting resistors, the potential drop at the diode develops for larger values of the reverse bias voltages. And by measuring the potential drop as a function of lateral bias, I can actually reconstruct the transport behavior of the interface, even if I don't know the current flowing through the system. Notice that it is kind of important because in this case, I didn't try to measure the current flowing through the system. I can do that and I'll show you the examples of how it can be done, but even the partial information. This is another example of the transport behavior across the grain boundary in the bicrystal. So I use the same approach. I have a strontium titanate grain boundary. I apply this wave across it. I measure the potential drop, drop of the grain boundary, the function of the lateral bias. And from the potential drop at the grain boundary, the function of lateral bias, I can reconstruct the voltage characteristic of the interface. And uh, from this voltage characteristics, I can reconstruct the transport property of the material. And in this case, I try to compensate for the cantilever contribution. So it uh, allows me to change the signal a little bit. And I compare my measurements derived from scanning probe microscopy to the measurements derived from the classical IV measurements. And it turns out that both my nonlinearity and uh, coefficient and conductivity are very, very close. So basically it goes to the point that my transport measurements using the KPFM are close to being quantitative. So if I account properly for feedback effects, if I account properly for the cantilever, no local part, I can get numbers which agree very well with the macroscopic measurements. Now, the important thing is that uh, we have to contend with the presence of the screening charges. So this is the example of the bias applied across the interface. And then if I turn the bias off, I start to see that the grain boundaries change sign and I have a change in the screening charge. So is this an important effect? In this particular case, not really because the potentials due to the screening charges don't exceed tens of millivolts, and I measure something of the order of the 100 millivolts. The interesting question becomes is how would the screening charges affect the spatially resolved information? So in this particular case, I can analyze not only the magnitude of the potential drop across the interface, but also the relative shift of the potential drop across the interface. And it turns out that the effective position of the grain boundary shifts by about 130 
nanometers from forward from positive to the negative bias regime. And in the classical semiconductor model, this would give me information about the space charge in the system. So the shift of the center of gravity of the grain boundary is uh, proportional to the depletion region. Practically, uh, this shift represents the shift of the screening charges rather than uh, intrinsic charges inside the material. So I can trust the magnitude, but I cannot trust the position to be representative of the intrinsic material responses. It's a, a property of the surface compensation. Now, what about more complex case? So in this particular case, I'm looking at slightly more complex device, the Zener diode, which is formed by the uh, semiconductor uh, PIN system. So we have a undoped region between the two well-doped materials. And this is also the example. This is surface topography. This is the potential of the grounded surface. You see difference in the CPD between the metal and the semiconductor. This is how the potential looks like for the reverse bias and for the forward bias surface. And notice that you start to see the interesting potential feature that forms here across the interface. So if I want to get some more insight inside this system, I'm going to look at the potential of the grounded reverse and forward bias surface. And I'm going to look at the electric field. So electric field is applied by differentiating the potential. And I can see that in this particular case, I have a region with almost uniform electric field inside the material. So this is my weakly doped semiconductor, which is biased. Uh, it is not immediately all visible from the 3D representation, but on the potential profile on the reverse bias surface, I see that there are two regions, this um, curved one and the straight one. If I differentiate, I can see that my region with the built electric field is still here. But additionally, I have the potential drop at the interface between the strongly doped semiconductor and weakly doped semiconductor. And for the forward bias condition, I still see this built-in electric field, even though I start to have some field penetration inside the weakly doped semiconductor. Now I have a positive potential drop in the strongly doped semiconductor and weakly doped semiconductor. So this feature between lines one and two stays almost the same. And then potential drop uh, depend, develops of the interface between the on the boundary one with the magnitude determined by whether it is reverse or forward biased. So I can estimate what is the built-in electric field at this interface. So in this material, this is about 210 to the 5 volts per meter. And I can also see how the Zener diode operates. So this is a textbook example. And notice that unlike the Schottky diode or the grain boundary in Stronson Titanate, which is just a single interface, and I can resolve the operation using KPFM or I can do it using the macroscopic measurement. In this case, I get the insight into the internal operation of the device that I cannot do using the macroscopic measurement because they will simply not show me what happens inside. What about polycrystalline materials? So in this case, we just go from the problem which had one interface to two interfaces to the problem which has multiple interfaces. And in this case, we also have the interfaces which are not parallel anymore. So these are a few examples of the KPFM measurements on the polycrystalline material. So this is a polycrystalline solar cell when we have two electrodes. We look at the surface potential when the material is grounded. And when we look at the potential of the material is biased. So if we bias in one direction, this grain is bright and this grain is dark. When we bias in the opposite direction, then this grain is bright and this grain is dark. We can do the same thing for the polycrystalline ceramics, for example, zinc oxide. So here we have two electrodes. You can see in the electron microscope the uh, grain structure and the pre and the bismuth phase impurities. So you can clearly define the grain boundaries. We can apply biases between the electrodes. And we start to have a beautiful pictures of the potential evolution of the polycrystalline material. So this is the surface topography. It's fairly flat. You just see particles. This is the surface potential on the grounded surface. So you see that zinc oxide grains 
have a uniform potential and uh, these grains are basically the bismuth containing impurities that segregate on the grain boundaries and make a varista varistor. And this is the potential distribution when I apply plus 5 and minus 5 volts. You can see that the materials start to develop this uh, beautiful potential distribution when potential is uniform within each grain but rapidly changes in the grain boundary. So this is a grain boundary resistive material where potential drops happen at the interfaces. And in principle, we can uh, reconstruct the current flow in the system if we take the derivative of the potential. Practically, these maps are not very reliable simply because they are controlled by the uh, topographic artifacts. Sorry, not topographic artifacts for the non-local cantilever effects. More importantly, uh, we don't know how the screening phenomena are going to affect these behaviors as well. So information is semi-quantitative. Also, we don't know the local current for the Schottky bi diode, for the Zinner diode, and for the grain boundary. We know that the current is perpendicular to the interface. So in this case, we don't know the local current and we cannot reconstruct the IV curve. We just get a semi-quantitative picture of the transport behavior inside the Of course, uh, we can get some quantitative measurements by uh, looking at the system with a higher resolution, getting the topographic image, getting the potential on the ground surface and uh, potential of the bias surface, and reconstruct the potential drops at each interface as a function of the lateral bias. However, we cannot reconstruct the IV curve unambiguously. So to do that, we will need to have a full potential distribution in the whole system that can be normalized to the external current. So this is another example of this type of measurements when we look at the positive temperature coefficient of resistance device. So basically, this is a strongly doped barium titanate ceramics, which at low temperature, which has a non-conductive grain boundaries, but at low temperatures, the ferroelectric polarization compensates the grain boundary charge and they do conduct. At higher temperatures, the polarization disappears and the grain boundaries start to become non-conductive. And uh, as you can see, if I apply lateral bias across this device at low temperature, I see the uniform potential. If I increase the temperature and apply bias, I can see how the potential drops start to develop across the interface. So this is the PTCR mechanism. And uh, I can even compare these measurements with the piezo response microscopy measurements. So piezo response gives me the measure of piezo electricity. Uh, but uh, KPFM on the lateral bias gives me the information about the grain boundary activity. So you can see that at low temperature, I see the clear PFM contrast, so the system is ferroelectric, but there are no potential drops. And at higher temperature, there is much weaker piezoelectric activity, but there are potential drops. And the onset of the potential drops and the disappearance of the piezoelectricity are perfectly correlated in temperature. What's interesting is that the bulk transition for this material is about 100 degrees, and the transition in local measurement happens at about 50, so it's not clear what happens. So most likely it's a problem with the dynamic range in this particular. So uh, you can read more about this uh, transport measurements in this publication, so primarily exploring different aspects of the KPFM in the lateral devices. Now, summary here is that uh, KPFM is the perfect tool to study the uh, DC transport in single interface and multiple interface systems. So in single interface systems, it would be quantitative. At multiple interface system, it would be semi-quantitative. The spatial resolution here is about 100 nanometers, plus minus. Of course, you need to take into account the cantilever effects. The voltage resolution is about 1 millivolt. Uh, going to frequency feedback allows much higher spatial resolution, but uh, at the cost of much longer measurement time. So what about other systems? So we can measure ceramics and semiconductors. What about nanotubes, nanowires?
So this is the example when we apply the KPFM to probe the electronic transport in the oxide nanowires. And these nanowires were synthesized for application of the sensors since the resistance strongly depends on the concentration of hydrogen. So what we wanted to find out here is to explore the sensing mechanism. So is it the whole nanowire response to hydrogen or is the junction between the nanowire and the electrode response to the hydrogen. So it turns out that the first thing we need to do is actually to study the structure of the nanowire device. And it turns out that doing it only by AFM is really not enough. So here the AFM shows a big nanowire and it shows a small nanowire crossing it. If we look at it in the electron microscope, we will actually see that this is not exactly a nanowire. This is a, actually a nanobelt, which is very broad, but very thin. With AFM, we will not be able to detect it because of the tip convolution effect. And the small feature that crosses it is actually a nanowire. So the idea here is that AFM allows a precise height measurements, but the lateral sizes are difficult to determine due to the tip convolution effects. At the same time, scanning electron microscopy provides the no information about the height, but a very precise data on the cross section. So ideally, we want to combine these techniques to actually have a good idea of what we are looking at. And then we start to see very interesting phenomena. So shown on this slide is the sequence of events when we have uh, our nanowire device on the microscope and we apply bias to the bottom electrode of plus six volts. And uh, uh, then we apply bias to the top electrode and then we apply bias to the both electrodes. So what you can see is that if we apply bias to the, say, to the top electrode and uh, uh, the bottom electrode is grounded, you can see that the potential drops halfway across the nanowire in the place where it kind of crosses the second nanowire. And this uh, polarity depends on the direction of the current. If I apply bias both to the to positive and negative electrode, uh, top and bottom electrode, I see that the nanowire is uniformly biased. Now, one very important thing here is that uh, in this measurement, it's also extremely important to ground the bottom electrode because if I don't ground the bottom electrode, I will see the uniform potential everywhere. So I really need to have the, to have the positive bias here, say whatever bias here, and I need to have a ground on the silicon that goes below the whole setup. Nonetheless, in this measurements, I can resolve the potential drops in the system. So I can find the potential drop at the top electrode, I can find the potential drop at the bottom electrode, and I can find the potential drop on, the, on this particular junction. And uh, if I have the macroscopic IV data, so I know the potential drops at individual elements, but I also know the total current flowing through the system, I can easily reconstruct the current voltage characteristics of individual structural elements. So I have the individual IV curve for each of these three significant uh, elements of the equivalent circuit. Of course, in the macroscopic measurements, I will have only the combined effect, and I will have no way to separate the individual contributions. Now, the important note of, of warning. So when I apply the bias to my system, I can see that my potential profile across the system looks like a broad hollow. And in fact, if I wait for two hours while having the system bias, I can see that the charges start to spread around on the sample surface. So you can see that the regions of the positive bias just kind of gets more and more extended. At the same time, if I turn off the bias, I can see that our positive charges become negative and start to become very visible. So what goes on? What happens is that surfaces in ambient are covered by the water layers, which contains mobile charges or can be electrically dissociated. If I apply bias for extended amount of time, these charges start to redistribute relatively slowly on the time scales of uh, tens of minutes and hours under the action of the electric field. And I can see this hollows of the charges spreading over the surface. So if I turn the bias off, 
then the charges remain for some time and it actually will take them some time to disappear from the material. This material, this phenomenon is very specific to material and environment. So the rainy day of Tennessee is very different from the sunny day in Albuquerque. Also, it's dependent on how you prepare the surface. If the surface is covered by hydrophobic agent, it's fine. If it is hydrophilic, then this behavior is much more pronounced. Now, the important thing is that, of course, there may be a fast component to the surface ionic charge motion, but most of the measurements we've done suggest that majority of the screening charges on the surface are very slow. They have a relaxation times of order of uh, tens of minutes. So if the measurement for oxide surfaces is done much faster, then this mobile charges don't matter. If the measurements are done much slower, then the dynamic of these charges become an integral part of And again, you can read more about the studies in the following uh, in the following publications. So including the studies of the nanovire and the general study of the potential screening on the oxide surfaces. Now, if the, if the surface charges exist and are sensitive to time, then the question is, can we use it as a positive? Can we use the scanning probe microscopy to study the dynamics of the surface charges or maybe even bulk charges? And it turns out that uh, it is entirely possible. In fact, one of the earliest papers exploring the dynamics of mobile charges on the semiconductor surfaces goes back to work by the Shockley himself, who in his uh, research labs, which was the very beginning of the Silicon Valley, used the read, magneto uh, read electrometer to map the potential evolution on the surfaces of the first prototypical semiconductor devices, and he basically discovered this presence of the surface charges. So the semiconductor industry was well aware of their presence, and of course, over tens of years, the semiconductor processing was optimized so that the surface charges stopped being that important. But in oxide systems, uh, this is something that we actually want to study. So the question is, how can we study fast charge dynamics? So KPFM is limited by the detection time to the time scales of, let's say, seconds. This is how fast we can uh, scan across the surface and get the spatial resolution. So the question is, can we reconfigure our KPFM measurement to measure the time response at each spatial location? And this is the approach that we uh, call the time-resolved KPFM or TR-KPFM. And the idea here is that we run a classical KPFM experiment, so the usual detection scheme using the lock-in in this particular case. But uh, what we do is we me do measurements on the dynamically biased device. So what I mean by that is that we have this classical triple electrode configuration. So we have a biased electrode, we have the rounded electrode, and while the tip is standing in one location, we apply the short voltage pulse to the biased electrode. And we measure the cantilever response both before the application of the bias and after the application of the bias. So this allows us to extend the KPFM to the time domain and measure the potential at each point with about three to five millisecond time resolution. And of course, using the G mode or for example, David Ginger type of detection scheme, this can be extended to the microsecond range, but let's talk about millisecond. So this is how these measurements look like. So this is our excitation waveform applied to the lateral electrodes. And this is the response that we expect. So we expect that the electronic subsystem will respond fast and the ionic subsystem will respond slow. So the ions take time to move around and then on the other hand, once they move, they take their time to move back. So this is the whole logic of the time resolution. And this is the example of how the TR-KPFM data set look like. So bear with me as we go through this measurement in some detail. So here, 
this axis 0 to 100 microns is the lateral spatial axis so this is for example distance between the two electrodes the this axis from 0 to 20 seconds this is the time axis this is the time after the bias pulse and obviously the vertical axis is the potential so if you now look at the surface and these two lines what you see here is the evolution of the surface potential as a function of time so here we have one electrode so it's grounded the potential is well defined here we have a second electrode its bias potential is also well defined sort of obviously subject to the cantilever contribution and uh, what we look at is the potential distribution between the electrodes as the function of time during the bias and after the bias so in the first moment just when we apply the bias pulse the potential distribution between the electrodes is almost linear so linear is a classical behavior that we expect in the electrostatic case so if we have the uniform resistance bit inside the material so this is just a ir drop but as the time goes by you can see that the potential distribution while the bias is on start to change and after we went wait for 10 seconds you can see that there is a potential drop inside the device and then which is now smaller and much larger potential drop at the electrode so what happens in this case is the textbook example of the electrode polarization in the initial moment the electrode is not polarized we just see the uniform potential distribution between the electrodes and after application of the bias pulse we slowly develop the electrode polarization and now the part of the potential drops at the electrode and the remaining potential drops inside the material so we get the picture of the electrochemical polarization of the material what's interesting is that if we turn the bias off you can see that the potential for a short amount of time become negative because the potential disappeared but the ionic charges remain and if the electrode is positive then the screening charges are negative we turn the bias off so the ionic charges remain for some time so they're negative we measure negative potential and if we wait then these charges are going to relax and we study the relaxation so it turns out that this trkpfm is rather powerful tool that allows us to get rather deep insight into the lateral dynamics in the devices so these are a few examples for several material systems so for calcium dope barium ferrite for lithium niobate for cerium oxide and uh, for uh, bithium ferrite we do the measurements at different temperatures so you can see that here for low temperature we have relatively weak relaxation for high temperatures we have an onset of ionic mobility and the relaxation becomes much stronger for lithium niobate we look at the behavior the function of the applied bias pulse so for 30 volts nothing happens so we have almost static potential distributions they don't change with time but for 70 volts we start to see that on one of the electrode we start to have the charge injection so we have a this very characteristic relaxation uh, what is interesting that in this case uh, we have actually increase of the potential compared to the applied one so this is a specific form of the charge injection physics which i'm not going to talk about in this presentation but keep in mind that this type of studies is possible for, finally for cerium oxide so cerium oxide is the supposed to be a good ionic conductor at high temperatures and we don't know exactly what it does at lower temperatures so in this particular case you can see that for low temperatures it actually gets very strongly polarized so the application of the bias results in the strong polarization of the interface and uh, you can clearly see the development of the potential drop in the bias on state and surface uh, remains charged in the bias off state and these charges are easy to inject but they don't go anywhere if we go to the higher temperature then we start to see the relaxation behavior so we inject these charges and then we increase the polarization with time and when we turn the bias off 
the charges slowly relax. So depending on the material system, bias level and temperature, we can get rather interesting information about the charge dynamic and the screening of course, we can get it a little bit more quantitative. So, for example, we can explore the time dynamics using the uh, lithium ion base. So, here we have a material with the positive and negative domains. So, this is two electrodes. This is the region that we study. And the PFM image shows that there is a positive and negative domain. So, you see them on the FISA image, and they are separated by the domain wall. We can do the time resolved KPFM measurements and we can see that there is some difference in the surface behavior for positive and negative domains and we can kind of analyze the kinetic characteristics by just doing the exponential fits to our in other materials like bismuthferrite we can study behavior the function of both temperature and the bias pulses and we can see that at low temperatures we have the behavior which is purely electrostatic in nature. So we measure the potential distribution and we also measure the current distribution during the measurements. And for higher temperatures, we start to see the strong relaxation, which is also associated with the transient in the, in the current behavior. So we start to get the insight on the electrochemical polarization. What's rather interesting is that depending on conditions, we can see the evolution towards the polarization, so ions can move, but they cannot leave the material, towards the onset of the ionic conductance. So the material start to be electroformed, and actually currents start to increase as a function. And uh, in fact, we can even create the electroformed region next to the electrode, and the material behave now as the junction between the conductive region and the non-conductive region. So it's really rather exciting. So with this TRKPFM method, we can study not only the transport in the static devices, but also in the devices during the electroforming. And uh, of course, we can study the interplay between the uh, time and the voltage phenomena. So we can configure our measurements in the TRKPFM mode when we change uh, both the a relaxation and the magnitude of the applied bias and we can see at which bias intervals we start to see the onset of the electrochemical polarization so this goes close to the field of the electrochemical force microscopy and the multidimensional spms so at this point i will just say that this is possible and i will leave the details for a different so uh, the additional information about uh, the TRKPFM is available in the set of papers by Evgeny Strelkov and uh, Liam Collins. So they're available here. And this is one of the techniques that uh, is available at the Center for Nanophase Material Science and can be used as a part of the... Now, what about the frequency domain? So both the KPFM of the laterally biased devices and the uh, time resolved KPFM explore the relaxation of the surface potential measured in the time domain. In the KPFM, we do it first as a function of position and then as a function of time. So our time resolved measurements are slow, they're limited by the speed of the time of the position resolved. In the TR KPFM, we basically implement the time resolved measurement at each point using essentially the pump probe. What about the frequency? And uh, the idea here implemented in scanning impedance microscopy is that rather than applying the DC bias across the interface, even rapidly varying DC bias, we are going to apply the AC bias across the interface and keep the bias of the tip constant. So there are two parts of the scanning impedance microscopy. One is the detection, so how the oscillation of the cantilever can be transformed into the oscillating surface potential. And the second part is the distribution of the amplitude, the phase of the voltage across the system. So let's start with a very simple uh, 
very simple example of the say grain boundary or Schottky interface doesn't matter but the interface that has the resistive and capacitive component so this is a simple RC circuit and we need to have the two circuit termination resistors so in the beginning of the lecture I said that without the circuit termination resistor the circuit is not defined so for the scanning impedance microscopy it's even more true than it is for KPFM so in this case we can measure the phase distribution across the surface and the amplitude distribution across the surface. And when we do these measurements, we can measure the amplitude and phase change across the interface. So it turns out that for simple RC interface, we can calculate the phase shift across the interface and the amplitude change across the interface for low frequencies. So here the phase shift linearly increases with omega and high frequency limit where the phase shift goes as one over omega. And we can find the crossover frequency between the uh, low and high frequency regime. So it turns out that the crossover frequency is determined by the properties of the interface. This is just the interface time constant. And this is determined by the properties of the current limiting resistors. The frequency shift, oh, sorry, the uh, phase shift across the interface is determined by the interface capacitance, but it's also determined by the circuit termination resistance. And for low frequency regimes, so both R and RD matter. So the word of caution here is that scanning impedance microscopy is non-local. And this is really, really important that when we talk about the impedance measurements, so in this example of the RC circuit, border plot, cold pole plot, the response of this element in terms of impedance is determined by this element only. If we have several elements, then the impedances add up. In the scanning impedance microscopy, we developed this method in order to study the impedance, the resistance and capacitance of the individual element, but the measured response depends on the remaining elements of the equivalent circuit. It's not only local. It's not a big problem because in some cases we can quantify it or find other strategies to characterize our data, but it's really important to know. So there is, we cannot use this method to measure only the RC properties of the interface, ignoring what else is there in the system. So it's non-local. However, uh, once we have these measurements configured, we can calculate how our phase shift and amplitude ratio will change across the interface. For example, these are the calculation for the Schottky diode and the changing circuit termination resistors, and we can experimentally measure it. Now, of course, experimentally, we are not measuring the amplitude and phase of the voltage across the surface. Experimentally, we measure amplitude and phase of the cantilever, which is excited by the voltage. And we know that there is a relationship between the amplitude and phase of the excitation force and the cantilever response, given by, for example, by a simple harmonic oscillator model. However, if we look at the math, we know that tip dynamics is a convolution of the lateral transport and the tip response, However, the variation of the phase angle and the amplitude ratio across the surface are frequency independent, at least if we are sufficiently far enough from the resonance. So the absolute values depend on the frequency and the ratios do not. So basically, if we measure the phase angle change and the amplitude ratio across the surface, these are material specific, but not dependent on the detection system. So that's why we can and this is the example of the application of um, impedance microscopy to the Stronson Titan A grain boundary. So, this is the grain boundary when we apply the triangular wave across it very slowly. So, each line corresponds to its own bias. We can reconstruct the potential drop across the grain boundary, the function of the lateral bias, and we can reconstruct the current bias curve out of it. So, I've already shown you. But what we can do now is we can plot the, measure the 
potential, the phase shift across the grain boundary and the amplitude ratio across the grain boundary as the function of frequency. And it turns out that this behavior is exactly what we expect for the simple RC model. So basically, knowing the measured from scanning probe microscopy phase shift and amplitude ratio, we can basically reconstruct the capacitance of the interface. And this interface capacitance is very close for the microscopic measurements. So the scanning impedance microscopy gives me 4.6 times 10 minus 2 farads per meter square, and the impedance spectroscopy gives me 5 times minus 2 farads per meter square. So it works remarkably well. So it turns out that now I have a method that allows um, to measure the resistance, not only resistances, but also capacitances of the but if I can measure the capacitance at zero voltage, I can measure the capacitance uh, of the interface for the non-zero voltage. And here comes the true power of the combination of the KPFM and the scanning impedance microscopy, because now I can measure the capacitance voltage characteristic of the single interface. And this is the example. So this is the tangents phi. This is uh, my measured signal as a function of the lateral bias for different circuit termination resistors from 150 ohms to about 5 kilo ohms. And uh, I can calculate the capacitance out of this data, and I can plot the grain boundary capacitance, which I measure directly, as a function of the grain boundary potential drop that I also measure directly. And I have a universal curve, which is what I expect. So I kind of expect the capacitance voltage characteristic of the interface to be independent on the uh, other circuit elements. So it works remarkably well. And of course, it works for other devices. So this is the example of the same measurements for the Schottky diode. So I do the measurements of the phase shift across the surface and amplitude. And what I see here is the convolution of the material response and uh, the cantilever response. So you can see this clear resonance behavior. However, if I go from phase to the phase shift, it's no longer dependent on the cantilever properties. And if I go from the absolute values of the amplitude to the amplitude ratio, it's also not dependent on the uh, resonant frequency. So I can take this data, I can fit it by the uh, this simple model, and I can extract the capacitance of the interface. Uh, I can extract the capacitance for different circuit termination resistance, and that means for different uh, potential drops across the interface. And if I combine these measurements together, then I start to get the uh, capacitance voltage curve for this individual interface, which I now measured locally. And uh, as for the Strobes and titanate bicrystal, this capacitance voltage curve is measured locally, and it's now independent on the uh, circuit termination resistance, so it's universal. Now, what about the extra details? So again, the great advantage of the scanning probe microscopy measurements is that it gives me information about the spatial position of different mechanisms. And what turns out is that if I look at my data and look at the potential profiles, I see that there is some rich structure in terms of where the potential drop happens. So it turns out that there are two uh, individual Gaussian elements in this case. And then when I look at the data for very small circuit termination resistance, I start to see the additional region where the phase gradient appears. So I really don't know why it happens. So this is something that waits for the future studies. In this case, I explored only the essentially macroscopic properties of the interface. But it turns out that there is a lot of internal details in this potential dis in the spatial distribution of this property. So this is something that with the new methods such as band excitation and the G mode uh, can be looked into in more detail. So <clears throat> you can find more details about impedance measurements and scanning impedance microscopies in the following publications. So and uh, some additional insight into specific grain boundaries in the, uh, this two papers. Now, 
can we extend this methods to the polycrystalline materials? And the answer is yes, of course. So this is the example of the topography and the scanning impedance microscopy measurements on the Biffman fer ferrite uh, ceramics. So this is there was a time when this material was actually explored in the ceramic form, not only the thin film forms. And uh, it is possible to see the potential and drops and phase changes at 10 kilohertz. But for example, at the 70 kilohertz, they look totally different. And it turns out that if we look at the impedance uh, spectroscopy data, we can see that we are in the high frequency regime and we can even calculate the expected phase angles from the uh, impedance measurements and we can compare it to the SPM data and we get that they are roughly comparable. So all the interesting relaxation phenomena happen in the very low frequency regime, so below what is convenient for spectroscopy. So the analysis of impedance uh, microscopy poly polycrystalline material is relatively straightforward. You just represent it as the multiple resistive and capacitive elements and potential drops. And basically you can get an estimate of uh, uh, how it behaves and where the potential drop happens and at which frequencies. So for example, in this Biffen ferrite, uh, we explored it and we saw the phase changes at the grain boundaries, so they're important. We saw no phase changes in the ferroelectric domain walls, so the ferroelectric domain walls did not affect the electronic transport inside this material. And of course now we know that in uh, thin film Biffen ferrite, the domain walls can be a uh, very important element affecting the transport behavior, but in these measurements, they were just static, so they didn't affect. Uh, interesting observations were done for the impedance microscopy in the polycrystalline semiconductor. So in this case, we observed some very interesting uh, signatures in the phase images across the grain boundaries, which seem to be consistent with the carrier generation and recombination away from the interface. So we found the, uh, that the frequency dependent on the phase shift was close to that expected uh, from this simple. Another interesting example of the scanning impedance microscopy as applied to the polycrystalline material is the case for the calcium copper titanate. So this material got people very excited about uh, 20 years ago because uh, it showed extremely high dielectric constant of the order of tens of thousands and potentially hundreds of thousands. And uh, the question was, is this dielectric constant related to the fact that material is ultra-polarizable and there are reasons why it shouldn't be uh, possible at room temperature, or whether this is a grain boundary behavior? And obviously, the question was that grain boundary behavior is relatively trivial, whereas the ultra-high polarizability might be some interesting physics. So the question is, is it the grain boundary effect or is it the bulk effect? And it turns out that uh, this is an example of the problem for which uh, Kelvin probe microscopy and scanning impedance microscopy are uniquely suited. So we can have the same material, we put the electrodes, we look at the grain boundaries. So this is the picture for illustration. This is kind of zinc oxide. But this is the example of this calcium copper titanate. And you can see that if we apply the bias, we start to develop the potential drop at the interfaces. So this is our first indicator that the grain boundaries here are not conductive because potential drop drops at the interfaces, not in the, uh, not in the individual uh, grain. And then if we do the scanning impedance measurements, we can map the magnitude of the uh, SIM amplitude as a function of frequency, and we observe that uh, at 70 kilohertz, there are no phase changes across the interface. And the question is why? The answer is very simple, because if we do the classical impedance measurements, we will see that there is a uh, classical cold cold behavior when we have a flat curve up to about 100 hertz, and then we start to have the response which goes as about one over frequency. So this is the transition from resistive behavior to the capacitive behavior. If we look at this diagram, when we have contacts, 
we have resistance and capacitance of the grain boundary and the resistance and capacitance on the bulk. That means that when we do measurements on the low frequency, so the KPFM measurement, then we follow the blue path. We have the resistance on the grain boundary as the relevant element and we see the potential drops in the grain boundary. At the high frequency corresponding to impedance microscopy, then the capacitance becomes a relevant element and so the grain boundary is basically shorted through the capacitive element and we don't see change on the SIM phase on amplitude across the grain boundary. So basically these measurements confirm that the ultra high dielectric constant of this material is the purely grain boundary phenomena because we can see that the grain boundaries are active uh, elements of the equivalent circuit at low frequencies and they're irrelevant at high frequencies. So the range of material systems we can study by SAM is pretty broad and basically it is limited by the uh, frequency range of our system so it is anywhere between hertz uh, to hundreds of kilohertz and it's limited by the phase sensitivity of the good locking amplifier and of course an interesting opportunity going forward is the combination of the SIM with the new detection schemes including band excitation and the G-mode methods. Then you can read more about the applications of the uh, SIM to the polycrystalline materials in the following publications. So the bismuth ferrite, the general review of oxides by SPM and the application to the calcium copper titanate. Now, let me show you a few more examples of the transport imaging in the lateral structures. So this is the case where we start to, so we looked at the single interface system, we looked at the multiple interface systems, we looked at the single nanovirus system. Now let's look at the multiple nanovirus system. And this is the example of the uh, carbon nanotubes in polymer deposited between two gold electrodes. And it turns out that with the electron microscope we can clearly differentiate them and see where they are. Question is, can we study the transport of the system using the scanning probe microscope? So it turns out that if we look at the topography of the system, we see the gold electrodes and we see the something on the surface, but we don't see the nanotubes very well simply because they're below the surface and hidden in the polymer. However, if we apply the bias to the top electrode, you start to see that the top electrode is biased and you can see that there is a conductive path going across the nanotube. Now, a very important thing is that this measurement is possible using scanning impedance microscopy, but it's absolutely impossible using the Kelvin probe microscopy. And the reason for that, if I apply DC bias rather than AC bias to the top electrode, then my whole system will get biased. So because of the charge injection and lateral charge spreading, I will just see the uniformly white region. So impedance microscopy allows us to get a high spatial resolution because only the bias region is active. And that allows us to remove the contribution of the ionic charge dynamic on the sample surface. So it is uniquely well suited for the mapping of the transport behavior in nanoscale systems. So if I bias the bottom electrode, I can see that much larger part of the system is biased. And I can compare the biased region using the top and bottom electrode and find the regions where the potential drop happens. So the current... It turns out that uh, I can get a much higher spatial resolution and I showed you the example of the tip calibration using the essentially scanning impedance microscopy setup. Uh, but the problem is that uh, that becomes a problem for the quantitative measurements because in this case uh, my strength of my signal depends on the size of the nanotube or nano object. So for small nanotube capacitance is smaller so the signal is smaller. For large object, the capacitance is larger and therefore the signal is larger. It turns out that if I want to compensate for these capacitive effects, I just need to play with the biasing procedure. So I need to bias both top and bottom electrode and use it as the calibration factor. And uh, once I do that, I can get a quantitative maps of the potential distribution 
uh, from the top bias electrode and dual bias electrode system. Uh, and this is the example of how these behaviors look like. So what's interesting is that these potential distributions are also frequency dependent. So the, this beautiful forest of the bias nanotubes that I see below the uh, surface shows the contrast, which is very much dependent on the frequency applied to the system. The question is, why does it happen? It turns out that basically, if I want to understand this behavior, I need to analyze it as the distributed transmission line model. I assume that I have a network of the carbon nanotubes that have some internal resistance. This network is capacitively coupled to the bottom electrode. So remember that we always have to keep the bottom electrode grounded, otherwise the whole thing is floating and biased. And it turns out that for this uh, transmission line model, I can easily analyze the potential distribution of the bias network. And the dynamic that I observe experimentally agrees pretty well with the dependence that I expect from theoretical perspective. And I can estimate the inverse decay lengths and such. And again, you can learn more about uh, this uh, system in this book. Now, in general, application of the Kelvin probe microscopy and scanning impedance microscopy for nanowires and nanotubes gives us some very interesting applications. So for example, we can map the potential distributions in the active device. So this is SIM image of the case when we apply bias to the top electrode and the bottom electrode is grounded and we see the uniform potential drop across the active device. Again, because we are using SIM rather than KPFM, our resolution is much higher we don't have to deal with the lateral uh, distribution of charges and we don't have to deal with the effects of the bottom electrode. Of course, it's very easy to overdo it. So in this particular case, I apply to higher bias and the electrode is burnt. But now I can see exactly where it happens. So I'm doing a failure analysis. So if I apply the bottom electrode, then only the electrode is biased and everything else is not biased. If I apply bias here, then I see that the electrode in the nanotube is biased, but I also see the region where the potential dropped. I can also map the surface topology. So for example, in this experiment, I can also find the second nanotube connecting top and bottom electrode, which I really don't need. Then I can break it off. And more importantly, I can also use this uh, systems in order to characterize the tip. When I use the, when I scan the nanotube with the tip and I measure the signal strength over the nanotube, the nanotube is much smaller. So rather than characterizing nanotube with the tip, I actually characterize the electric properties of the tip with the nanotube. And this is kind of a different example when my tip is so bad that I see two nanotubes and this happens because the tip is actually now double. And I showed you example of how we can use this type of information so for a good tip in order to actually get the transfer function and spatial resolution in the key. So this is how it is done. So if we have this uh, zoom in on this broken nanotube, we know that this is under constant bias. We can write down the interaction between the tip and the surface using the convolution of the tip shape. Uh, so the probe function and the surface potential distribution we know what this experimentally measured signal is. And if we know the experimentally measured signal, so this is with a very good approximation on Lorenzen, we can find this pro function, which is C prime Z X Y. And uh, this uh, scanning impedance microscopy signal basically gives us the unambiguous measure of the tip radius. And uh, we had a patent to it for about 20 years ago read more about this approach in this publication, which is also available on the archive. Now, what is the limitation of the scanning impedance microscopy? The limitation is, of course, that the signal is not local. It depends not only on the uh, capacitive characteristic of the interface, it depends on the rest of the circuit. Also, it is affected by the stray capacitance in the system. If we have the carbon nanotube between the two gold electrodes, the capacitances between the electrodes and the back gate are much more important than the capacitance of the defects inside the nanotube. So for the point of the measurements, this is a perfectly 
linear element because we never can get to the sufficiently high frequencies at which the capacitive properties of the defect become important. Of course, there are other elements, for example, our bandwidth of detector is generally limited to something like 2 to 10 megahertz, but practically it's the stray capacitance that matter. So what? The answer is that we can go from the linear detection to the non-linear detection. So what I mean by that is that for a linear system, only the main harmonic of the modulation signal exists. And uh, this main harmonic is determined by all capacitance of the system, the one that we want to measure, and the stray capacitances, which are much larger. But at the same time, if our system is nonlinear and uh, we apply two frequencies or say one frequency and look at higher harmonics, then the nonlinearity will result in the formation of the frequency mixing, either the second harmonic signal or the frequency mix component. So for example, if I apply frequency omega and omega plus delta, then I will start to get the responses at the frequencies of 2 omega plus delta, 2 omega plus 2 delta, delta, and so on and so forth. So use of this frequency mixing should allow me to do two things. First of all, I should be able to address uh, much higher frequencies by using this down conversion. And secondly, I should get rid of the linear elements. For example, the capacitance between the gold electrode and the back gate is huge, but it's linear. So it shouldn't participate in the frequency mixing. So how can I do that? Well, first, I want to try to look at the simple frequency doubling, just the nonlinear phenomena. And what I do in this case is I take my usual device, I apply the bias across it, but now I detect not only the first harmonic of the signal, which is just the linear RC behavior, but I also measure the, the response at second and high order harmonics. And what happens in this case is that the interface, due to the rectification of the current flowing through it, start to act as the current source at uh, the end harmonic of the excitation signal. So my equivalent circuit becomes the RC element for the interface, the current termination resistors, but I also now have the uh, current source located directly. And it turns out that this approach actually works remarkably well. I can measure the uh, DC signal. This is just a KPFM signal. I can measure the first harmonic amplitude and I can measure the second harmonic amplitude and phase across the interface. And I can show that the Schottky interface, Schottky diode start to generate this high order harmonics close to the region with the maximal nonlinearity of the AVC. Uh, I can do the same thing for the frequency mixing. So in this case, I apply uh, two signals across the interface, so at the frequency omega and frequency plus omega plus delta omega. The problem I have to solve here is that I have the intrinsic frequency mixing at the interface, but I also have the frequency mixing in the tip surface junction because uh, the electrostatic forces are quadratic, so I need to come away to separate. However, this approach works. Again, if I apply the signal like this across the interface, I would be able to measure the strong nonlinearity across the interface in the region where there is a maximum nonlinearity of the current voltage curve. These are the few examples of how this data looks like. So these measurements were done at the time when we didn't have band excitation or the GMO detection, so a lot of this was basically done manually. But it illustrates that the principle of the frequency mixing across the interfaces work remarkably well and potentially provides the insight into what happens. You can read about this in these two publications. Now, let me talk about the uh, last technique relevant to the lateral transport measurements of the active devices. And this technique is scanning gate microscopy. So the reason why we're interested in the scanning gate microscopy is that we know that objects like carbon nanotubes or any one-dimensional systems can have defects. So this can be contact, this can be junctions, that can be atomic defects. And uh, when we apply the transport, uh, the DC or AC transport across these systems, 
we measure the DC or AC potential drops. So we can see if these defects are electrically active. But it turns out that in these systems, we can also configure the measurement slightly differently. When we measure the current across the system, we keep the tip at the fixed bias and uh, we start to detect the field effect. So if uh, the system is close to one dimensional, then the bias of the tip start to work like a mobile gate. If the tip is over the uh, defect, it can cause the local band bending and suppress the conductivity across the defect. Obviously, the uh, magnitude of this effect depends on the local electronic structure. And the interesting opportunity here is to combine the scanning gate microscopy and scanning impedance microscopy. So the scanning gate microscopy gives the information of the defect position and the gate activity. And the impedance microscopy gives the information about the defect related transfer. So we can kind of. This is the example of the movie when we measure scanning gate microscopy and scanning impedance microscopy at the same time. And you can see that uh, scanning gate microscopy shows the conductance, scanning uh, impedance microscopy shows the potential drop. And you can start to see a very interesting thing that for uh, high biases, we start to see the big spots on the scanning gate microscope, but at the same time, we start to see spots in the scanning impedance microscope. So it's almost like potential distribution across the system is not uniform. So what happens? Let's look at the several uh, snapshots from this movie. So for our gate bias being minus 5 volt, so the impedance microscopy shows the uniform potential drop across the device, so it's in a conductive state. And scanning gate microscopy shows that the T bias slightly enhances the transport across the nanotube, so we make it more conductive. Once we go to the uh, Uh, lower voltage, we start to see that the, we start to see the development of the negative spots. So these are the regions where the application of the bias to the tip suppresses the conductance. And the impedance imaging start to show that the potential distribution across the nanotube is non-uniform. So is it possible? Of course, in the normal system, it's not possible because we don't have current sources inside the nanotube. But practically, it happens because uh, we disturb the transfer through the nanotube and detect it at the same time. So the tip basically accesses the transfer in the gated nanotube. So it's a self-gating effect. What's very interesting is that the spatial resolution of this uh, impedance measurements and this self-gating regime is much higher than the spatial resolution of the SGM. Because in scanning gate microscopy, once our tip bias is strong enough, we suppress the current inside the nanotube to zero, and therefore we cannot measure anything anymore. If we increase the bias magnitude, then we start to suppress the current at larger distance. So the higher the bias, the more poor is the resolution. In scanning impedance microscopy, we measure the residual transport in the nanotube. So we are sensitive to much more subtle changes in the conductance across the nanotube and therefore our spatial resolution ends up being more. Of course the question is what the defects in the carbon nanotubes are and uh, for quite a long time people speculated that in order to understand them we need to be able to establish the relationship between the scanning gate microscopy signal and some specific characteristic of those defects. And we need to understand what the defects are and connect it to the first principle. So we were able to quantify the defect behavior in terms of the turn on voltage versus Fermi energy. So we in some sense quantify the depth of the trap associated with the defect. And it's possible to do it by just analyzing the electrostatic of the tip tube backgate system. So we can quantify this uh, turn on voltages. When it comes to the theory, that's a different story. So this requires the combination of uh, scanning tunneling microscopy or electron microscopy with the SPM. So you can find more details about these measurements in these references.